Now, we have four friends that can help alert us that we are thinking in a way that contributes to violence. These four feelings are very helpful because when we feel these feelings, we can use them as an alert that we're thinking in a way that's contributing to violence on the planet, and here is an opportunity for us to transform that thinking. So what are these four friends that we have? Anger, depression, guilt, and shame. Whenever we're feeling those feelings, we are thinking in a way that we have been taught to think for about 10,000 years, a way of thinking designed to make us obedient to authority, but a way of thinking that is not conducive to safety and peace on our planet. So we can use those feelings as a wake-up signal. Wake up. We're thinking in a way that's not conducive to peace on the planet. Let's transform the thinking into one that promotes peace on our planet. So let me show you what I mean. When we work with groups on the subject of anger, that's a good feeling to teach us nonviolent communication because anger tells us that we are disconnected from our needs, which are the central part of nonviolent communication. And anger tells us we're thinking in a way that creates violence on the planet. I was working on this subject with a group of prisoners in a prison, and uh, one of them uh, was very angry on this particular day, and I asked him uh, what the stimulus for his anger was. What did somebody do that is triggering his anger? I could just tell he was so angry. He said, I made a request to the prison officials two weeks ago for some job training. I still haven't heard from them. I said, yeah, that tells me what the stimulus was for your anger. Now, what's the cause of your anger? He said, I just told you. And I said, oh, no, you remember from our previous session, I tried to make clear to you that it's never what other people do that makes us angry. It's how we think that makes us angry. So what are you telling yourself that's making you angry? He said, I don't know what you're talking about. People can make you angry. I said, no, people can't make you angry. If you followed me around in my work, you'd see this very clearly. For example, when I'm working in several places around the world where there's been a lot of violence, such as Rwanda, I was working with a group of people, all of whom had had at least one member of their family killed. And some of them were so angry that all they could live for was vengeance and think of getting back at the other people. And some of the people who had had horrible things happen to them were not angry. They weren't repressing the anger or denying it, but they were not thinking in a way that creates the anger. So not even something as dramatic as having a member of one's family killed can make you angry. So I said to this prisoner, so what are you telling yourself that does make you angry? And after a moment he said, well, I'm telling myself it isn't fair. I need the training that I requested. And they're just, you know, ignoring me and treating me like I'm nothing. And, and he went on to give several other statements of the judgments that he had of the prison officials for not having gotten back to him about his request for job training. I said, okay, now you've answered my question of what causes your anger. Anger is caused by how you think. You think language that is disconnected from your needs and makes violence enjoyable. As the Christian theologian Walter Wink said, we've been educated for many years, thousands of years, to make violence enjoyable. See, all you need to do to make violence enjoyable is think there's bad guys and that these bad guys deserve to suffer for what they've done and it can make it enjoyable for you to create pain for these people. So anger is a very valuable feeling. It tells us we are perpetuating the thinking that creates that kind of anger. So with this prisoner, I showed him that it's valuable then when you are angry, to be conscious that you're angry because of your own thinking. 
and not because of what the other person did. The other person's action is a stimulus for your anger, but not the cause. The cause is your thinking. Then I said to him, it's also very important, once you have identified the thinking that causes your anger, it's important to be conscious that that thinking is a tragic, suicidal expression of an unmet need. See, Anger tells us, in other words, that a need of ours isn't getting met. But our thinking doesn't connect with that need. Our connection goes to judging the other person who is the stimulus in a way that creates the anger. So I said to this prisoner, now go behind those judgments that you're making of the prison officials for not responding to your request for some job training. And what's the need behind all these judgments, that they're not being fair, they're treating you like you don't exist? What's the need that's behind all that thinking? He thought for a moment and said, I need to develop myself. I need skills for developing myself so I can earn a living when I get out of here. Otherwise, I'm going to end up back in here very quickly. Then I said to him, Now, how are you feeling at this moment that your attention is on those needs? And he said, I'm scared. I'm scared. You see, we cannot be angry when we're connected to life. And what I mean by connected to life is to be connected to our needs or to the needs of others. We can only be angry when we get disconnected from life and go up to our head and think in a way we have been programmed to think, to think in terms of wrongness of the other person. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being angry. Uh, that would be unfortunate if I come across that way, because... A lot of people have been educated to think that if you're a nice person, you don't get angry. And they've been taught to repress their anger. So I'm certainly not saying that. I'm saying the opposite. Anger is a friend of ours. It tells us we're thinking in a way that's contributing to violence on the planet. We're a part of that violence. And anger wakes us up and gives us a chance to transform our thinking to a kind of thinking that creates peace on our planet. So I said to him, notice how differently you feel when you're in touch with your needs than when you're judging the other people. When you tell me that you're scared, that you're not going to get that need met. And he said, that's right. Now I said to him, you tell me you have an appointment to talk to them later this afternoon, the prison officials? He said, yes. I said, do you think you're more likely to get your needs met if you go in there thinking of what's wrong with them for not having contacted you by now and feeling angry about that? Or are you more likely to get your needs met if you go in there connected to your need for wanting to develop yourself and aware of your fear that you may not develop those skills? No matter what you might say to them, do you think you are more likely to come out with your needs met if in your head you have judgments of them implying wrongness on their part or if you are conscious of your needs? He said, it's obvious. I'm much more likely to come out of there with what I want if I go in conscious of my needs. I said, I'm glad you see that. And at that moment, he walked over to the other side of the room and sat down and had a very sad look on his face. And I said to him, hey, what's going on? He looked at me and said, I can't talk about it right now. After lunch, he came up to me and said with great sorrow in his voice, Marshal, I wish you had taught me two years ago about anger, what you taught me this morning. If I had known that two years ago, I wouldn't have had to have killed my best friend. And then he went on to tell me this tragic story about how the friend said some things that just totally outraged him. And then he was thinking that he was angry at his friend for saying those things. He wasn't aware that the friend didn't cause his anger. The statements didn't cause his anger. It was how he thought about them that caused his anger. And he saw that if he could have connected to what his friend's needs were behind what the friend said, or if he had been connected to his own needs at that moment, there would have been ways of finding out 
strategies for meeting everybody's needs, and he wouldn't have had to have killed his best friend. So this principle is very important to liberating ourself from language which is not conducive to our well-being or peace on the planet. And the awareness is that all language that implies wrongness, that is a criticism, insult, diagnosis of pathology of others, all such language is the cause of anger. Other people are never the cause, only the stimulus. The cause of anger is our thinking. And that thinking that causes the anger is a distorted expression of an unmet need. A distorted expression that not only interferes with getting the need met, but makes it enjoyable to be violent to others. So, whenever we're angry, nonviolent communication shows us how to stop, breathe, become conscious of what you are telling yourself that makes you angry. And when you see the thinking that makes you angry, transform it into the need that it's distorting. Ask yourself, wait a minute, what need of mine is not getting met that's being expressed through judgment of the other person? And you'll know that you have gotten connected to your need. Your body will tell you so. Your spirit will tell you so. We live in a different world when we are connected to what is alive in us, meaning our needs. We live in a different world than when we are up in our head judging other people in terms of rightness and wrongness. Now, learning how to become literate with the language of life, our needs, is going to take some practice. We're going to need to practice transforming language which stimulates violence into a language of life. What's helped me over the years to develop more of a language of life and less time of my life being angry and judging other people What's helped me is an exercise that I do that I will recommend to you. In this exercise, I keep a book with me, something to write on at all times, so that any time I get angry, I write down the stimulus for the anger, because very often at that moment I don't have time to transform the thinking that creates that anger. But I don't want to miss this learning opportunity, so when I get angry at someone, I make a note about what did this person say or do that stimulated my anger. Then, when I have time later on, I then say to myself, now, what was I telling myself that made me so angry? And I become conscious of the thinking that was going on in my head that made me angry. Just that is helpful because it keeps reminding me that it's not the other people that make me angry. It's what I tell myself. And then when I see what I have told myself that makes me angry, I ask myself, now what need of mine was not getting met at that time that was hidden behind the way I was thinking about the person? And then I translate that judgment of the other into a need of mine that wasn't met. And again, as soon as I get connected to that need, I'm in a different world than when I'm up in my head judging people. I like the way Rumi the poet expresses this. He says, there's a place beyond right and wrongdoing. I'll meet you there. And nonviolent communication supports us to live in the place beyond right and wrongdoing. In a place where People see each other's needs and enjoy contributing to each other's needs. But anger tells us that we are thinking in a way that blocks our needs, that blocks our awareness of our needs and the other person's needs. So it can be a helpful friend, anger. We can use it as a wake-up call to identify the thinking that's making us angry and transforming it into an unmet need. 
Now, when I was first learning how to do this transformation of my anger, it would take me a while because I was very skilled at judging what's wrong with other people in a way that would make me angry. But I wasn't very skilled at understanding my needs, getting connected to my needs. So it would sometimes be awkward when I was angry because I would stop right there at that time, take a deep breath, identify the thinking making me angry, connect to the need behind it, and then I would open my mouth. But this would take me some time, and this was awkward in certain situations. For example, one time my oldest son and I were having a disagreement, and this was at a time when I was first learning nonviolent communication, and something he said and the way he said it just really stimulated some anger on my part. So I took a breath, and I saw what I was telling myself that made me angry. I saw the need behind that, and as soon as I saw the need creating the anger, I no longer felt angry. Then, when I opened my mouth, I came out of a different energy than if I had reacted immediately out of the anger. But this was taking me some time, and meanwhile his friends were outside waiting for him, and he said, Dad, it's taking you so long to talk. I said, let me tell you what I can say quickly. Do it my way or I'll kick your butt. He said, take your time, Dad. Take your time. People who have known me in the days before I learned nonviolent communication are very patient when I take my time. They know what comes out quickly. They're willing to wait to hear what's really alive in me and to hear that life in me described in a way that doesn't imply wrongness on their part. So one way in which we can make our own life much more enjoyable is whenever we are thinking in a way that is causing anger, depression, guilt, or shame, to transform that thinking into what need of ours is being distorted by the thinking that's causing those feelings. 